uh, start off tonight um, just really by way of introduction is from John's Gospel in chapter 20 and he says these words here almost the end of the chapter almost the end of the fact of the book of the Gospel of John and he says uh, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. You know, in these days of uncertainty, many, many things are uncertain in our world around us. People are maybe wondering what's going to happen to our nation because of what's happened with the Brexit and they're still not sure what the, all the outcome will be. We think of the elections that are taking place in the U.S. of A., wondering who's going to be the next president and how the whole world seems to be focused and wondering what's going to happen on whoever becomes president of the United States, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And you know, we think of many things that could maybe think of uncertainty. We think of the immorality that goes in on in our world. We think of murders, wars, laws that have recently been passed even in our own land which contradict the law of God. And the word of God has always been attacked. It's from being attacked from all sides, whether it's by liberal thinking, whether it's by so-called science and evolution. And yet, the, the word of God, the Bible, stands true. It is, you can say, what a book that we have. And yet, even many so-called Christian ministers would even deny the, the truth of this word, this book that we have. A survey was recently done in the United States and uh, it was done with Christian ministers. Asked them some, some questions and asked them, for example, if they believed that the scriptures are the inspired and the inerrant word of God. You know, was the word of God, was it without error? Was it inspired by God? And it was fascinating to see what the answers were from so-called ministers. 87% of Methodists said no. 95% of uh, Episcopalians of the Church of England said no. 82% of Presbyterians said no. And 67% of American Baptists said no. So-called Christian ministers, ministers denying even the truth of the Word of God. But the Bible, it still stands. The Bible, even within the book itself, it says all Scripture is inspired. God breathed. Some of the things we want to look at, first of all, to look at the accuracy and the, the grandness and the majesty of this Word of God, this Bible that we have, that we can read so freely. First of all, historically, this Bible, that Word of God, is not just a book you know, we will go to for spiritual truths, to find out spiritual, nice spiritual truths. No, this Bible is, is accurate histor historically. For example, up to a number of years ago, people denied that even the Bible could be written in, in, a, in a language more than 5,000 years ago. The, the, the question the existence of Abraham, it questions the place where he came from. If you read back in Genesis, you know that Abraham, he came out of a place called Ur of the Chaldees. And this was basically thought of as a myth. This place was thought to be, it never existed. And then there was a man in 1922 called Leonard Woolley, discovered that this place, Ur of in of, or of the Chaldees in the Middle East, and they discovered that this place, the people who lived there were skilled in algebra, geometry, and quadratic equations. It's other ways we can look at the Bible historically. For example, you remember we read also in Genesis. You remember you read about Joseph. You remember he was sold for twenty pieces of silver. This actually corresponds with the Egypt, Egypt, Egyptian uh, records. They have records at that time, at that age where Joseph, when Joseph lived, that a slave would be sold at, for 20 pieces of silver, exactly corresponding with the accuracy of the Bible, showing indeed that this Bible, this Word of God we have, is, is accurate, historically accurate. There's many other things you can look into for yourself if you want to find that, to prove that. The Bible is accurate historically, it's also accurate scientifically. A number, uh, number of years ago, a few hundred years ago, it used to be thought that there was only a, a certain number of stars. They thought there was only 1,030 stars in the, in the sky. When they looked up at the sky, that's all they could see. But yet the Word of God 
Um, we read in the Word of God that the hosts of heaven cannot be numbered. The Bible is accurate. The Bible is right all the time. It was thought a number of years ago that the sun was basically the center of the universe, that it never moved, that all the planets evolved around the sun. And yet when we read in verse in Psalm 19, it talks about the sun, it says, The sun goes forth from the end of heaven, and its circuit onto the ends of it. And in recent years, they've been able to prove, indeed, that the, the sun goes in an orbit like the planets, although it may maybe take millions and millions of years in its orbit, but the fact is that the sun it does go in an orbit, just like the way the planets go round the sun. And the Bible was right all the time. The Bible's right historically, it's right scientifically. But then the great, some of the greatest proofs, proofs within the Bible itself is the, is the fact that it's right prophetically. When you look at some of the evidences from the Bible, from the, the prophetic, some of the prophetic things that were that are predicted in times past. If you're reading the book of Ezekiel, chapter, uh, verses, chapter 26 to chapter 28, you read a prophecy about uh, there was a city called Tyre. You remember Tyre and Sidon? Well, if you take time to read through them chapters, you, you will read that uh, it was prophesied that there would be nations that would rise up against it, that one day it would be reduced to rubble, and that one day a fisherman would use the place where it used to stand, would use it to put, uh, put down their nets. And this prophecy came through. Came through. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar rose, came against it, and then Alexander the Great, you know him from history, he, he came against it, he destroyed it, reduced the city to rubble, and scattered the rubble on the place in the, on, on the beach. And today, exactly as prophesied, the place is used for fishermen to dry their nets. This Bible is accurate, it is true. We can't go against it, we can't go against what it says. You can read in the book of Nahum, uh, in chapter 1, verses 8 to 10, it says about uh, the city of Nineveh and what would happen to it. It said Nineveh would be, would be destroyed by a flood. Now, up until a few hundred years, uh, people wondered where ne did Nineveh, Nineveh ever exist, whatever happened to it. It was never, didn't seem to have ever existed hardly. But yet they've been able to find out. Uh, people have st who studied history and geography discovered that it was destroyed by a flood by an overflowing of the banks of the river Tigris. This Bible, this book that we have, is true while you look into history, while you look into science, while you look into prophets, and into the prophets, how the prophecies all came true. Go on about prophecies. Go on about the prophecies of the nation of Israel. Someone asked somebody, how could you prove to me that the Bible is true? And somebody replied in one word, Israel. People of Israel have been scattered to the four corners of the earth, as was prophesied by in the in the Old Testament. They still and they still exist today. You don't see any of the other nations found in the Old Testament. For example, you don't read of a people called the Hittites or people like that. Why? Because God had His hand on on the people of Israel. They were His chosen nation. You could think about the prophecies regarding our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They say there's three, over 330 prophecies in the Old Testament about Christ, how he would die, the place where he was born, all that type of thing. All these things came true. They were accurate. They were fulfilled. No other book in the, in the world has this record. This is the greatest book we have. Children go to school, they learn from science books. They learn from poetry, English books. But the greatest book that they could ever read is the Bible, the Word of God. We can't go against it. Many people know you may be here tonight and you may even agree with what I'm saying. You may say, yes, this is a book that you can prove the accuracy of. It. You can prove the accuracy of it, how historically prophets. All these things are true. You may agree with it. You may study it. But that is not the point of the Bible in itself, is it? Go to, with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Just over to Second Timothy, please, in chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul, he was writing his letter to Timothy, and he says, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, he didn't say to Timothy there, he says, uh, 
From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise. He didn't stop there. Yes, the Scripture can educate you regarding history and all those facts and do all those details are in order, yes. But that is not the reason we have Scripture. The Bible tells us there is a God, one God. The Bible tells us that we are sinners. The Bible tells us that we deserve God's judgment. The Bible tells us there's a place of punishment for those who reject God. But the Bible tells us there's a Savior. That's why Paul said to Timothy that scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. There's only one way. There's one salvation. Yes, you can be saved. One way of salvation, through, you make thee wise unto salvation. How? Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ has said about the Bible, you remember he was speaking of the Bible, he said uh, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 4, 7, and 10, every time he was confronting the devil, he used the words, it is written. You know, he could have spoke to the, Bible, the devil. He was God himself. He could have said this, you know, go get the behind me, Satan, like he said to Peter, or words like to that effect. But three times he used them words, it is written. Highlighting the, the importance and the vitality the word of God is, because we go to the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. And uh, this is what, why Paul said to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is through the scripture you find salvation and is found in no other way but through Christ alone. Yes, it is written. The Bible confirms the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. And then we go to another word, words in John 19, verse 30. Talking about the Bible, it is written, it is the word of God, it is infallible. But going to John chapter 19, all the words similar to these, it says, the first one was it is written, and then this one, it is finished. This is one of the seven, seven, seven sayings of Christ when he was on the cross. And the girls were actually singing it about in one of the, I think it was the first piece they were singing. Uh, John chapter 19 and verse 30. Remember of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was on the cross. And he says these words here. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. You know, when he was on the cross, Lord Jesus, it wasn't the words, I am finished. It says, it is finished. It didn't say, I am finished. Why? He was the one, he was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the one, he was very God himself. No one could have the power to take it from him. No one had the power to take his life from him. You know, if you look at that verse there, it says, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He was in control of the whole situation. The, the fact that he was God himself, no one had the power to take the life from him. This wasn't just an accident that happened in history. This wasn't a fact that for, uh, somehow man happened to overcome him. Man somehow came, came along and put him on the cross. It was all predicted, it was all prophesied that Christ Jesus would come into the world to save sinners. This was the reason why he came. He was in control. He didn't say, I am finished. The one on the cross was the, the Son of God. He was God the Son. Yeah, his death, was, it wasn't an accident. It had been planned from before the foundation of the earth. Remember, read about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. This something was controlled. This is the, the central uh, pinnacle point of history, as uh, you could say. This is a... It was, yes, it was the worst thing that man could ever do, putting the Savior of the world on the cross, the one who was God, the one who was perfect, the one who was holy, who had never sinned. This is the worst thing that man could ever do. But the other side of it is, it was the greatest thing that ever happened. Without this, uh, without the Lord Jesus Christ going to the cross, without him taking our punishment of our sin, no one could have a chance of getting into heaven. We can't get into heaven by doing good. We can't get into heaven by reading the Bible. We can't get into heaven by doing good works to our fellow man. He came with the purpose. As someone said, he was the only one who ever came to die. All of us were born 
We think about the new children who were born. We think about the children who were born recently in the, uh, to people in the fellowship. Child, children of mankind, we were all born to live. But because of sin, we die. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he came in this world for the sole purpose of dying. He came to the cross to take our sin, to take our punishment. He suffered emotionally. You know, he, the whole Jewish race, his own people were against him. His own best friends deserted him. He suffered mentally. He knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to enter into death, not just not for himself, but for other people. He who knew his new sin. He suffered physically. He was wounded. He was tortured brutally. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And he suffered, of course, spiritually. He was, George was talking about the table this morning. Uh, my God, my God, why hast thou uh, forsaken me? Forsaken by even God the Father. Why? Because he was taking your punishment and he was taking my punishment. He didn't say, I am finished. We know that because the very fact that we're here today, the first day of the week, we're celebrating the fact that Christ rose from the dead. He didn't stay dead. Death couldn't hold this person. That's why he didn't say, I am finished. Death couldn't hold him. He rose from the grave the third day. He defeated Satan. Death held the grave. He had paid for the price. He didn't say, no, I am finished. And then in our hand, he didn't, I, he didn't also say, he didn't say, they are finished. You know, by rights, if justice had been done that day, he could have called 12 legions of angels. He could have called 10,000 angels and destroyed every man that ever lived on the face of the earth and rightly condemned man and woman to a lost eternity. We don't deserve heaven. No one here deserves heaven. No man, one in Kilkeel deserves heaven. No one in Ireland or in the world or ever lived deserved heaven. He could have called 10,000 angels. And he didn't say they are finished. That's it. They have done their worst. How could they have done it? God could have rightly condemned us to it to a lost hell. But no. What did he say? He says, it is finished. It wasn't a, a cry of defeat that day. It was a cry of victory. You know, some people would say, you know, when, when he was on the cross, they said, oh, if you're the son of God, save yourself. They would have thought of maybe if he had to come down from the cross. But someone said rightly once, you know, we don't follow Christ because he would come, could have come down from the cross. We follow Christ because he stayed up on the cross. Because without that payment for our sin, without him being the substitute, without him being the Lamb of God for our salvation, we would have no, with no possibility, no way of salvation whatsoever. That cry that was on the cross that day, it is finished. It wasn't a cry of defeat. It was a cry. It was a verifying cry. One that verified he had completed everything that had gone before, completed the prophecies that had been in the past, completed all the things that had been said about to him in the Old Testament. It was verifying what he had done. He had been in control of that situation, the creator of the world. No one could take his life from him. He was on that cross. He was verifying that everything could be completed. It is, uh, it is finished. It was a vicarious cry as well, you could say, because he was our substitute. He was taking our place. He took our punishment. He completed. He paid the price in full. And as I said previously, it is a victorious cry. He made the way. He, no one, nothing could stop him. He came to the cross. You remember, he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. He was going to go there. He came with the purpose of going to that cross to take your sin and my sin. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. He paid in full. full made full purchase for our salvation. There's not another thing that we have to pay. You and I don't need to spend one day in hell because Jesus Christ paid the price in full. He paid it all. He went there. It paid the price in totality and for all of eternity. It is written. The book speaks is true. The word of God. It is finished was a cry from the cross, a cry of victory. And then one other it is phrase we find in the Bible to finish off with. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 6. Chapter 21 and verse 6, and it says, And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, 
the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. It is done. The cross, the cry from the cross that is finished was talking about the redemption, the price paid for our salvation was complete, never needed to be, be sacrificed. It was one sacrifice forever that never needed to be repeated. If we say that sacrifice needs to be repeated, then we're saying that when Christ died on the cross, it wasn't enough. Just to clarify that, there was a verse I was looking at just earlier on, was in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter, chapter 9, the last few verses of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, 27. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was, off, was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. A sacrifice that was made once and for all that never needed to be repeated. Yes, that's why he was able to cry from the cross. It is finished. Complete sacrifice that never needed to be repeated. But then finally, to finish off with, it is done. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 6. This is at the end of history. Remember, John was given this revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ was showing him uh, the scene uh, for the things to come. And then it is at the end of history, uh, what John was seeing here as we know it. The cry from the throne of God, this time it's not from the cross. This time this cry is from the throne of God. And comes this announcement which says, it is done. The one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, he announces, it is done. The one who is God, who is sovereign over all, is able to announce this. This world is not just going to happen. Things are not just going to go on. Uh, the end of time, man is not just going to continue on and on forever and ever. God has a plan. There's a time day coming. When Lord Jesus Christ, he could come back again any time. He could come back tonight, even before the end of this meeting. But here is a plan for, that God has for this world. He is going to bring judgment on this world. Yes, there's going to be the great tribulation. This, uh, the, Lord, sorry, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will come back first. The saints will go to uh, be with him. There will be seven years of tribulation. There will be the thousand years of Christ's millennium on the earth. And remember then, at the, right at the end, he's going to cast uh, hell, the devil and all his angels, into the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. And this is when we we'll get this announcement right at the end of time. It is done. It is finished. It is regarding the history of the world then. The one who is God himself announces this from the, from the, the one who is in control of all things, announces this from the throne. All evil, you might, if you read, uh, take time to read at the beginning of chapter 21, you remember he said, John, he had seen a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven had passed earth. Uh, they were passed away and there was no more sea. And... Uh, you can read down on through Revelation uh, on to verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. On that day, there's not going to be any more crying. We can't imagine what life, you know, we can hardly, well, we can hardly imagine what life would be like with, without crying. Tears, there's tears and grief happen day and daily across our, across our world, across our town, across our families. Death happens. There's going to be no more tears, no more pain. We need hospitals. There'll be no, no such thing as hospitals. No need for policemen. All that type of thing will be done away because there's no more evil. No more devil. No more sin. All done away. And of course, the last enemy to be destroyed will be death itself. There will be no more death. That's all done away. Something that we, can't, uh, we can only imagine, try to imagine what that would be like looking into uh, one day when going to be, all these things are going to be. And it's then that the, this cry comes from God himself. Lord God, he says, it is done. In verse 6. And he says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. I'm just thinking, only the, not everybody be, will be there. 
If you think about that verse, it's going to be a tremendous day, yes, for those who are ready, for those who are saved, who are going to be in heaven forever and ever, to be able to hear God say, it is done. All that is in the past, but not everybody is going to be there. Those who have rejected God's offer of mercy, those who have rejected God's offer of salvation, they will not be there. Only those who have been saved, as this verse, verse 6 says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. Who's going to be there? Have you ever been conscious or uh, felt your need of salvation? Have you ever realized that you are a sinner in the hands of God? Do you know that this Bible is true from cover to cover? Do you know the reason why Christ died on the cross? was because of your sin and for my sin. It's to those who are thirsty, those who have thirsted for righteousness. Have you come to ever come to a place where you, at the end of yourself, you realize that without God you are lost, that you have cried unto him for salvation in the way that he has laid out? The Bible clearly divides us into two groups. Those who have come to God in the way that he has said, those who have cried out for salvation, those who have been to the cross, Seeing that Christ has paid in full the salvation for you, cried unto him. It is those who are going to uh, be in that group who, where it says, I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life. As you're thinking about this verse at this moment, can you say that you're going to be ready? Have you thirsted for salvation? Realizing that you deserve God's uh, uh, judgment, you deserve God's condemnation, you deserve to go to hell. But for what Christ has done for us on the cross, we can, we, we may be able to drink of the water of life freely. You may be saved. That is the reason why we have this meeting. We warn you of the judgment. We warn you of the condemnation that is due you. But we're here to, offer, to, to say to you, there's a way to be saved. You can be in heaven. You can have salvation. You can have eternal life. You can be in that place where you can hear God say, it is done, and enjoy peace and heaven with God for all of eternity. That's going to be a wonderful day. But the question is, will you be there? Will you be there? I will give unto him. What a tremendous promise that is. What tremendous promises we have in this Bible that we have. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is the only way to be saved. Why would God send his son to go to the cross for your punishment if there was another way to be saved? He needed to send someone. He needed to send the Savior. He needed to send the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He needed to die for your salvation and for mine. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners because we need saving. And that door is open. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come unto the Father but by me. It is written, what a book. What a brick we have. It's truth from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. It is finished. What a work. The work has been accomplished. It's been done for you and for me. Today, you and I can have salvation. Today, you and I can be saved for time and eternity. And then, looking to the future, will you be there when he says, it is done? May God bless these thoughts to our hearts tonight. And uh,